Hello and welcome back to the Long Live Rock and Roll podcast. In 1995, Oasis departed from the raw energy of Definitely Maybe in favour of a much richer and complex sound. What's the Story Morning Glory was significant not just for its commercial success, but for its role in defining a cultural and musical movement, perfectly capturing the spirit of Britain in the 90s. Its innovative approach to production, its impact on the Britpop scene and its anthemic choruses all contributed to it becoming one of the most famous and best-selling albums of all time. Joining me to discuss this album is my co-host, Mr. Felipe Amorim. How are you doing, bro? Doing great, man. How are you doing? Good. Yeah, not bad. Thank you. Do you want to hear about first world countryside problems? Yeah, tell me. It's really <laughs> hot here today. The sun's <laughs> out, but I can't open the window because the farmers have spread shit on the fields. See? <laughs> And it stinks. The house stinks. It's like a three-day thing. They should. They didn't warn us. Shit there. The farmers didn't warn us. No, they just spread their shit how they liked it on the on the field behind our house. Uh, it's going to be a, two or three days of it like this. But yeah, it is awful. And I'm hot and I'm sweating and I can't open a window because it stinks of shit. Yeah. Hashtag, hashtag first world countryside world problems. problems. Yeah. yeah, there you go. First world countryside yeah. problems. Like <laughs> country Specifically side countryside. That's what we do. Yeah, excellent. You, yeah. you did it right there if you okay. Yeah, it's all good. You know, it's, you know it's, um, it's, it's not too hot for my South American standards, so it's all good. Yeah. Has, the, has the Oasis buzz been going around London? Because uh, recently in the news, we've learned that Oasis have uh, a re- reuniting, aren't they, for a special tour um, in yeah, the exactly. middle of next year. Uh, so has, has, has that been the talk of the town in Soho? Yeah, yeah, a lot of people have been talking about it. I think everyone is talking about it, even people who don't like them. Because I think that's a, a, that's a really interesting thing about Oasis is everyone talks about them, even when they don't like them, isn't it? Yeah, it's- yeah. and actually, do you know what? I should start the disclaimer of the show because I don't want yeah. people thinking I'm in a bad mood today. I really can't stand Oasis, and I really don't like, and I really don't like this album, and I can't stand the Gallagher Brothers. However, that doesn't mean I can't be impartial and sort of adequately talk about its place in history. But just in case people think, "Oh, Laz is having a bad day today," he's not. He's saying having very a much. bad day for yeah, many no. reasons, including talking <laughs> yeah. about Oasis, countryside problems, Oasis. You know, so uh, so actually, Felipe is going to do the mon- monologue at the end of this episode because I kind of thought it'd be a bit disingenuous he if I did to it. Do it. Uh, hold on, yeah. I'm prima donna i just thought it wouldn't be very true if i sort of was spouting all this good stuff but in all joking aside i will be unbiased i will be impartial because this album is incredibly important and it's incredibly significant to british music rock music and britain in the 90s i think so i'll kick off as usual with a bit of info about the album so the album was released on the 2nd of october 1995 recorded between may and june 1995 we're going to touch on this but apparently it was only a two-week recording session uh, the studio was the Rockfield Studio in Wales. The genre is classed as Britpop, um, with a secondary genre being out-and-out out rock. The length of the album is about 50 minutes long. The label was Creation, and the producers was Owen Morris and Noel Gallagher himself. So I just want to do a bit of background about music in the 90s before we sort of go on to talk about the album itself. So this is a really significant time in the 90s because Britpop is kind of growing. It's... It, People think Britpop was at its peak between 94 and 97, so 95 is sort of bang in the right place for Britpop to be at its peak. However, it was still a rising genre because we had a resurgence of guitar-based music. If you think about the 80s, so much keyboards, so many synthesized electronic sounds, guitars, keyboards, organs, synthesizers, that actually at the beginning of the 90s, guitar-based music was being resurged. And obviously Britpop was a massive part of that, taking back the raw energetic rock of the 60s and 70s. Um, the other key thing about the about Britpop, which actually is only recently I learned about it, is in essence, it had its own little duel with grunge in America, which I, I wasn't aware of, you know, so they, they kind of saw grunge at the beginning of the 90s. You know, I'm imagining the people in Britain were like, hold on, they've got really good music over there in America. When, yeah. when did they give up all the synthesizers and crappy electronic music of the 80s? When did they get guitar music back? Exactly. You've got, you got the likes of Nirvana, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, all really doing the grungy stuff in America. And it's all guitar based. All guitar based, all emotional lyrics, all introspective, heartfelt lyrics instead of the cheesy 80s stuff we had before. And I think Britpop was a generational cultural answer to America's grunge. Now, Britpop is way more upbeat and happy than grunge. 
Uh, it's way more melodic. I feel like it has way more of a character and a popness to it. Um, but still, they were they were sort of fighting each other, you know, in terms yeah, of grunge in America, uh, Britpop in England. So, what do you think is the um, is the one particular element that makes uh, Britpop properly British as as uh, as opposed to um, to grunge, which is essentially American. What do you think it is? Because I have an opinion on that. I, I would, go on, I, I want to hear your opinion. I think it's the humour, isn't it? There's a t touch of humour, as I said, like the... the grunge the, is very the, serious. Grunge is, yeah, it's like, you know, like my dad hates me, life is crap. Yeah. I want to sing about this, I want to cry, I want to kill myself. Some people eventually did that, which yeah. is really sad anyway. But what I'm saying is, um, the, the, the Britpop stuff is like, yeah, here we are, you know, um, bringing the guitars back to, to 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 pop music and we're going to be as loud as the grunge guys but maybe we're not that miserable maybe we're just gonna make a little bit of a joke out of all of this yeah that's that's what i think that's a is. great point and and i think what later when we get to the you, you've got stuff to say about the lyrics and themes of the album right yeah we'll do it later then because i want to touch on something they call yeah. cool britannia so we'll come to that later but that'll right, explain cool. a little bit about what we said but um yeah I, I think things were in a really good place in britain and that's what we'll come on to later the world was uh, the, the world uh britain was a bit carefree in those times things were all going really well so i think people actually had the opportunity to sit back and say look how cool life is you know, in America, I'm not sure financially, politically, what was going on in the 90s, uh, the early 90s in America. But you do wonder if the product of grunge, if the result of grunge was a product of its time. Um, and I think music and politics, as though, although we try not to sort of mar them on this show and give political opinions, undoubtedly they always hand in hand because yeah. the politics of the time will often be reflected in the music. Now, it may not necessarily be pop music, the music that's being played on the radio every day, but in underground scenes like heavy metal and grunge, you will see the politics come out. So in Britain, things were good. Uh, things were really happy. Everyone was sort of living a good life. And as you said, the, this Britpop movement kind of just put a bit of humour into it and said, come on, let's, let's take a look at the, at the funny side of Britain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you can definitely see that. I'm hearing that in, in the lyrics and, and, and the over approach of... Uh, Britpop and and uh, um, although there's this like a uh, reputation of people in the UK to be really sad or, or a little bit miserable or complain about stuff um, you can see a lot of happiness in, in the 90s and can see a lot of uh, uh, um, prosperity yeah prosperity and that's reflected on the music for sure yeah, yeah. no I agree well let's talk about the music so yeah. going into that you know this album um, Oh, I got we got four different topics we're going to talk about: the recording and production, the sound of the album, the influences, and the releases. I think we should go for the releases first, because when I look uh, at a perfect way to release singles of an album, I look at this. Yeah, the album was released. When did we say October? Yeah, second of October ninety five. Twenty fourth of April, they released. Some might say. Yeah. Fourteenth of August, they released. Roll with it. Eighteenth of September, they released. Morning Glory. 30th of October, so the album's now out, they released Wonderwall. 19th of February, 96, they did Don't Look Back in Anger. And 13th of May, 96, Champagne Supernova. So one year, almost, let's call it 11 months. 11 months with a single, like, sort of every two months. That's how you market an album. And that it's undoubtedly really well has led to how the, the success of this album uh, in terms of sales. Because oh, you oh. Could, uh, it seems to me you couldn't get away from it. All these singles, and they yeah. you, you've you started to enjoy Oasis's new single, some might say. Three months later, they got another one out. Roll with it. Yeah, also, you have to have the same kind of... Um, uh, you have, you have <laughs> to have some sort of quality control for that, right? Yeah. Uh, if you pick the wrong songs, uh, although the album's got a lot of good, uh, good songs, well-written songs and potential hits, if you don't pick the right ones and release them in the best order, you might not make the best out of, out of the album. And I think uh, whoever was in charge of it in the label, they definitely got this one right. They did, didn't they? Because the three biggest songs yeah. that, I mean, I think it's arguable, but I think you'd agree yeah. with me, Wonderwall, Don't Look Back in Anger and Champagne Supernova are the three titans from this album right yeah because though you've got songs like some might say roll with it she's electric that are still famous those three i mean you and me know from how many wedding and pub gigs we've played oh yeah you will always finish the gig with wonderwall 
And yeah. if not, or it will be Don't Look Back in Don't Anger. Don't Look Back in Anger. Yeah. You've got to play those and, songs. And Champagne Absolutely. Supernova is almost always in the DJ set after the wedding. So it's like <laughs> these three, they're the titans of these songs. And they are literally timeless songs because they are still being played. What are we now? 30 years later. 30 years um, so it's really, yeah, really impressive. But and then, and then to have those three come out after the album's been released... It's just a little trick of genius, isn't it? Because you're yeah. kind of teasing people in with some might say roll with it, morning glory. And then when the album's released and people realize, oh, Wonder Wall's a banger. Oh, Don't Look Back in Anger's really good. Release them as singles, put something different on, get a new video in, get a new look yeah. to the songs. And then you're going to get them played and bought infinitely more. Yeah. Very impressive, isn't it, marketing scheme? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, anything, yeah. Any, about, yeah, about one, one, thing about, one thing about the... Um... Are we talking about the recording? And are you, you in yeah. charge of the, the subject? No, let's here, do it. Man. Let's do it. Let's go to yeah. Let's <laughs> so go yeah, to the, the recording. recording. So the interesting thing about the recording is Noel Gallagher um, claims that they actually recorded in twelve days. So if you say it's about two weeks, as you said, you have to consider that it takes um, you know maybe a whole day to get the drum sound right, and it takes maybe another whole day to you know check the microphones and the amps and 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 try the guitar tones and stuff like that. You know, it, it, it takes ages to do those things. But he claimed that they've recorded one song per day, which is mm. really remarkable in terms of, like, doing all the instruments of a, of a song in one day. Yeah. Uh, especially considering that he said half of the songs were not even written by the time they got into the studio. So that is... Wow. I mean, yeah. that's that's the key to some good songwriting, isn't it? That's the, yeah. um, so that, key. That's a sign of good songwriting, showing that, you know, you can come with a song that's not even fully finished, get it recorded in one day, but also finish the structure of them. And, the and you know what that what that means to me? Uh, maybe when you do that, you you don't have time to overthink the arrangements. And I think the, the way they play it, I, I don't know if you have this uh, opinion on their music. It's like, you know, when someone shows you a song, I've just written the song, they play the acoustic guitar and they sing on top of it, and that's it. Mm. Oasis sounds like, it's just one step after that. They just plug that guitar. They just yeah. do it with an electric guitar yeah. and put a drum and bass beat to it and just get to the end of the song and that's it. Yeah. Uh, that's a very simplistic way of defining what they do with arrangements, but essentially uh, um, it is what they do. Wonder Wall is a specific case where they have some strings. I think they have a cello. There, there's yeah. some st stuff going but, on. But that there's some stuff... clever ideas in there, but they're very, very subtle. But yeah. that stuff can be done afterwards or getting an yeah. orchestra in a studio. Yeah, yeah. In terms of what you're talking about, I read the saying that they did this in two weeks because yeah. they spent no time overthinking, second guessing, questioning what they did. They just went with their ideas, probably finished it off in the same way as well. You know, just thinking, oh, let's not overthink this ending. Let's just get it done so we can end the song and move on to the next one. I also read that the environment in Rockfield Studios, now Led Zeppelin have recorded, no, it's Led Zeppelin, Queen, no, Black no. Sabbath. They've yeah. all recorded there, and this is a Rockfield Studios in Wales. The rural countryside apparently lent it to Oasis in being a very casual, laid-back recording session. Yeah. Apparently things were very sweet, uh, sweet as in, you know, a uh, sweet man, you know, is it like a oh, yeah. really cool laid-back yeah. um, environment where they were able to immerse themselves in the album. And we know from experience, you and me, yeah. that this works. When yeah. you're doing a recording session in London, it's horrible. And because you're listening, you're on the bus or the tube, you're going to the gig, you're, you're sort of getting squashed by people, you can't sit down on the tube, you've got your he headphones in listening to the demo, trying to, you know, um, what's the what's it called, ghost play, you know, trying to remember yeah. your part. But then you've got to think, where's my stop? You know, am I getting off here? Then you've got to use City Mapper to walk to the studio. Whereas when we were and there's always a diversion on the bus. <laughs> yeah, that's always see. It's never straight. Well, the train gets stuck. And, you exactly. Know, whatever. But you and me know we went and recorded an album in Devon in the countryside, yeah. and we rented a house out, and it was fantastic yeah. because we just yeah. went there. It was five minutes from the studio. We came back each night, and we just sort of relaxed. Ordered a bit yeah. of takeaway. Knew that we needed to be in the studio 10 a.m. the next day. Had this lovely. It was like a, a forest, wasn't it? Woods behind yeah. us. Yeah. And it was just lovely. You're, you you take your head out of the everyday life and you put it into the album. And because of that, you get exquisite performances, you get dedication. Not that you don't dedicate a performance in London, but your mind is elsewhere, isn't it? Exactly. Uh, I think I think committed playing. Yeah, on top of that, you've got to consider they already had one big album. You know, they, they did really well with the first album. And so you've got the money, you've got the time, you've got the energy, the creativity. And you don't have 
you know, a lot of people fiddling on their phones like people do. Right. Look, this sorry. Think about <laughs> sorry, the, the definitely maybe was recorded in Manchester so studios in Manchester, Manchester, yeah. Wales, Cornwall, Liverpool, and London. Yeah. It's no surprise that with the different. second album, they wanted to be like, let's just choose one place <laughs> and, and settle be there down for, for a the couple two of weeks, weeks yeah. and get the album done. And yeah. they were probably touring at the time. Maybe that's the reason for the tight schedule. Yeah, you know, it yeah. Um, um, but the yeah, so just about the recording, and then to add to that, they did, apparently I read that they did a lot of live takes with minimal mm -hmm. overdubs, and I think you can hear that in the album. It sounds like a rock and roll band. It does, yeah. It sounds like a garage band, as, as we normally say, because like, oh, that that's an expression that probably comes from America, where most bands actually actually rehearse in garage. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, um, but I love that kind of vibe, a bunch of people playing together. Sometimes they are at different levels musically, but they can play together and sound good as a band. Yeah. And when we're going to put an album together, that's what matters. It's not like the individual talent or whatever. It's just sound good as a group. Mm. And I think... Uh, they do sound good as a group and this album. Uh, and as I said, it sounds like a band, you know, guitar, bass, drums, vocals. It's, it's very straightforward in that sense. I yeah. think that's that's the rock and rollness of the album, is the fact that it's it's playable by anyone, pretty much. If you have two guitars, bass and drums, and you start a band, you can play any song from this album straight away without missing any essential elements of the song. One thing that is at the forefront of the album is definitely the guitars and the vocals, isn't it? And this is yeah. what we call the wall of sound, where yeah. it's a sort of production technique where you focus very heavily on some defining features. And in this case, it's obviously the guitar and the vocals. Yeah. They are first and foremost at the front of the album. The guitar riff and the vocals are what matters most. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and it gives the... that punchy, energetic feel, doesn't it? Exactly. And one thing that happens with them is like, uh, you probably... Um, when you hear like distorted gu guitars, what you normally have is a power chord, which has two or three notes. Am I right? Yeah. Or is it, yeah. So when you play, <laughs> still remember playing power chords on guitar, but um, what they do a lot is like the whole chord, like is, that's why I said like, it's like playing acoustic guitar, but with distortion. Yeah. That's what it is. So they normally play the whole chord, not only the, the simplified power chord, which is common in, 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 in rock music. And it it makes it sound a bit uh, maybe it sounds a bit messy sometimes, but that's yeah, that's well, part of it. Yeah. But it's what is what ACDC does, yeah, you know, in and, a completely it, different style. But it's well, it's, it's a characteristic, it's a personality yeah. of the album, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, let, let's talk about the sound of the album then, in terms yeah. of like the the songs and everything. So, definitely, definitely, maybe was so much more raw, punky, energetic. Yeah. We move over here, and we've got a much more polished. Um, production melodic sound to the album haven't we you know yeah. i think of wonderwall and again i'm not going to go on about what i don't like about this album but i can't stand this song I, every time we used to play it at functions i had to sit there sit my way through it was the last song of the night and i'd be like i can't fucking wait to go home like just, oh now i've got to do this um <laughs> but the strings on wonderwall are fantastic they really give me kind of eleanor rigby vibes just yeah. with how it's almost like if you took the strings out, it would be a different song. Yeah, can, can I say something about the arrangement in this song? Yeah, of course. The strings, they start on the second verse, right? So there's a whole verse with just... That, I, I love when you, you add layers one by one, and it's it's a simple production, um, um, I'd say, idea that works really well in, in, in pretty much any songs. So yeah. you start with just guitar, actually just guitar, and then the vocals. And then the whole band comes in. When... When the second verse starts, you would expect the drum beats to be there right away. And the strings start, and the, there's a drum fill, and the beat starts on the second line of the second verse. Yeah. So it's like the drummer is one bar late intentionally. Yeah. So and you works, have the so second, yeah, it's just like, wow. It creates a I, sense know, yeah. of, um, yeah. uh, it's like tension. Not, not a musical a, yeah. tension where the two notes don't match, but you're like, hold on, something's yeah. missing. But, but like you're still vibing with the verse and suddenly the drums come back in and you're like yes that's, that's yeah what exactly <laughs> it's, it's it's actually super clever that one it's, again it's those subtleties they make an album sometimes yeah you know so i'm pretty sure if i listen to this album in, in 10 years i'm going to find some other element like that and think yeah. oh i didn't notice that you know i think if i had to sum up the album it would be catchy hooks memorable melodies and anthemic choruses yeah 
when you think of the intro of She's Electric, that guitar, the diddle, 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 you know, it's kind of, you just sat yeah. there. It's a bit, you're not sure where it's going until suddenly it drops into the verse. Uh, memorable melodies, again, the um, uh, verses, choruses, everything. The melodies are very simplistic. Um, and then the anthemic choruses. I mean, is there a more anthemic chorus? And this is where I get to say the part I want to say, despite everything I said, and despite my thoughts on Oasis, the album and the brothers, my statement is, don't look back in anger is one of the greatest songs ever written by a British band ever. Yeah. Beatles yeah. included anyone. And it's, and it's it not a matter stunning. of like, yeah, it is stunning, man. It is a stunning song. And I think, uh, the whole reason I went on to this is because of anthemic choruses. I, I can't think of a more anthemic chorus. People will say, you know, Mr. Brightside or I don't know, Sweet Home Alabama. But I think in terms of passion, emotion and feel that you can hear, them sing into that chorus doesn't get much better than that song. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, the interesting thing about that song is uh, um, they wrote the song, I think, without having all the lyrics and just jamming, playing at sound checks. I think um, Noel mentioned something about, I think it's his kid or some kid uh, said, or oh, what are you singing there? It was just like mumbling the lyrics, like making it up, or there was no actual lyrics. I said, are you saying... Uh, uh, um, so, is it so Sally can't wait? So it's like, the, and uh, so Sally can wait. Yeah, the, so that uh, he, he wasn't saying that, he was saying something else. I said, okay. Oh, you know what? That's what I'm going to say from now on. <laughs> and uh, it's those and little it, touches that yeah. make a song special. Yeah, but, but essentially, what he said, he said is the song is about not regretting whatever you did wrong in the past, and that's what it is. Wonder Wall is for his, his wife, but it was she was uh, his, his girlfriend at the time, and um. Is about. I think she was having a hard time, and he was. Uh, um, he was like, "No, no, no. You, you need to be there for me. You need to be strong." So, because I'm, I'm always like uh, in pieces all the time. So, basically, he was saying like, uh, uh, "You know, don't worry about whatever happened," and um, and and because because uh, I I needed to be there for me as well. Whatever. Yeah. So it's 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 again it's uh, real life stuff, right? That's why I like uh, uh, I like those songs because they're not. They know, Down although earth. they might have a pretentious attitude sometimes, the songwriting not necessarily uh, doesn't necessarily reflect that every time. Yeah, I think some of the songs are just like this is me talking about my life, and I think everyone can relate to it. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, in terms of instrumentation used, the reason I disagree, no, I don't disagree. The reason that I'd say it's more than just rock is because we get a lot more. We get lots of acoustic guitar and piano throughout the album and not individual little spots through most of the songs. Mm -hmm. Some songs, you know, Oasis, especially this album, they have this formula where they get a verse. Let's say they're playing at like 70% intensity for the verse. They'll then bring it down to 50% for the pre-chorus. Like, build, you know, I, I, I'm going back to Don't Look Back in Anger. And so I start a revolution from my bed. And then when the time for the chorus comes in, they whack it up to like 90% intensity. They throw in lots of stuff like piano, acoustic guitars, even some orchestral stuff yeah. as well. And I think that's a really, a really cool aspect of it because it does take it to the next step further than rock. Yeah, one thing you have in that music is a lot of percussion, a lot of tambourines, yeah. which and shakers and that stuff. And that, for me, that comes from uh, from the Beatles. The Beatles had a lot of that. I'm glad you made that segue. Um, yeah. Let's talk about the influences. Yeah. Uh, first of all, and first of all, is there anything, any other songs you wanted to talk about, or any other? I just, I just want to say, there's one song that is my particular um, favorite song in the album. She's electric, because okay. I love, I love this song that kind of breaks the mood of the album. It's in the middle of the album. It's got nothing to do with the rest of it, in yeah. my opinion. Uh, it's got like that shuffle vibe. Sounds a little bit like Beatles to me, and the lyrics are just like funny, and I like it. She's Electric is a great song, in my opinion. It's, 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 I wouldn't, it's not underrated. It's, it's a uh, well-known song for anyone who's an Oasis fan. Yeah. So, but it's, it's a, yeah, it's for me, it's as good as the, as the, 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 the main three. Yeah. Yeah. Influences. So I think you might have answered the question I was going to ask you, but out of yeah. the four big pop bands of the sixties, the Beatles, the Stones, the Kinks and the Who, who would you liken Oasis to the most and why? I'd say Beatles and Stones, but there's a little bit of T-Rex as well. Yeah, yeah, good, good point. Um, well, why? Because a lot of people the, the riffs, give, um... a, give a criticism of Oasis. Oh, they're just, they're just copying the Beatles. 
I see the argument for that. And even though I have this, even though I have the, the reason uh, to make that argument, I don't, I don't agree with it. No, I don't think it's just like copy and paste. Because if, if you say that, right, if you say that they're copying someone. So tell me exactly which song uh, was, you know, was... I'm going to answer you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> well, if you say like, yeah. this song sounds yeah. like the Beatles, which song exactly? The own, uh, I will point if to one example. If it sounds generic like the Beatles, then it's it's an influence, right? Not, not... You know the end of She's Electric? Yeah. Does it sound like the end of uh, Little Help From My Friends? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm joking. As in, that's the only. But time that's I fine. Can but that's not that's that not that like essential to the song, isn't it? No, like, exactly. You know? It's the end. It's the end. And sorry, just um, just a note for listeners and viewers: any song we mention is going to be down in the show notes in a dedicated playlist, so you can listen either before the show or after the show or with us. You got the full album in there, plus any little song we mention. So please carry on, Felipe. And specifically, that's a shuffle beat, like uh, with a little help from my friends. Yeah, same sort of groove. Yeah um excellent the sound i think uh yes yeah, so the influences i mean the beatles stuff a lot of people make the comparison i think it's fair and i heard in this album quite a lot of stuff the chord progressions now when we think of pop music now and being very generalizing uh, you think of four chords you think of chord one chord four chord five maybe chord six getting a little bit musical theory here these are the chords that bands like the beatles especially in their early days made up and made so familiar you know and there's yeah. a song called uh if you can find it on youtube it's called the four chord song a yeah. minor g c and d minor or d major and it shows how many songs have been written with these four chords as the, yeah. as the root of the song but here i hear lots of different stuff like uh, in the song hey now when he sings the line no time for running away now the song just takes a little turn it's one chord but it just takes a turn that makes you go oh that, that's not what I was expecting. And the Beatles do that a lot. And I thought yeah. that's what I heard in here. Descending bass lines, I think they do it in Don't Look Back in Anger. So it's like, you know, do, 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 mm. do. And they bass which, chords around which that. Which works as a preparation for a chorus sometimes. Or, works know. all over the place. The Beatles did it. They used it. Uh, James Taylor uses it a lot. Singer songwriters, they love that. Um, the other thing, simplistic melodies and solos. There's not one solo on this album I heard where you think, ah, he's trying to be flashy here. It's always delivering for the song. Yeah, and the solo is normally like a composition as well. It's just not yeah. like, uh, it's not yeah. playing so random that's, notes. And... That's what I heard that I could tie to the Beatles. With the Stones, I didn't hear that much. Maybe the energy, the attitude, the, the rock and rollness. But the, the intro to some might say, it's got a little bluesy touch, isn't it? Yeah. Which I think here with the Stones. The Who... I think this is where the attitude and energy comes in because you've got the distorted guitars, the heavy drums, the kind of hard rock aspects of it, the rock and roll lifestyle, the head banging, I imagine. And the Kinks uh, brothers. That's the comparison mm. I found. You know, the Kinks, Ray, yeah. and, is it John? <laughs> Ray and John Davies, I think, uh, were brothers. And I, they didn't have a good relationship as far as I'm, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and the same as Oasis. So yeah. I think it's cool that, with, you know, it's fair as a non, as, as a, let's call me a hater of Oasis. I think it's so easy for me to come in and say, oh, the beat, yeah, they're just copying the Beatles. But actually, when you think about it, they really have taken certain aspects from each of these bands, whether it's the attitude of the Who and the Stones, the, 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 the musical influences from the Kinks and the Beatles. It's, it's, you can only admit that they have made their own brand of music. And although it if might you, sound a little bit like the Beatles in places, if it's you still original. <laughs> If we had Noah Gallagher in the show, what would you say to him? I feel like my integrity would, that I would be more than happy to say, no, I don't like the music and I don't like the album, but I'm really, you know, but I respect you because how can you, this is, well, you, you, know, do how can it, you, you did it really well. <laughs> how, yeah. How can you not respect it, man? Like, you know, yeah. this is where I feel like our show, I don't want to say it stands out because I don't want to say that no one else does this, but Look at what we're doing. We're doing an album. I chose the album because I know how important it is. Yeah, actually, yeah. I listened to the album a few years ago and I was like, no, I don't really like it. Listen to it in depth this week. And I like, actually, I hate it. But, <laughs> but, but I'm still here giving an impartial, unbiased opinion on it, you know. Um, and I think that, you know, this is what we, <laughs> this is what we want to do. You know, if, if, if people come and listen to us as ex-musicians, um, ex-musicians, as pro-musicians, um, for an opinion on just two regular guys who tour the world, we play music, we love music, 
we've got to be honest, but at the same time, you've got to give credit where it's due. There's plenty of albums by big bands that I don't like that we will do yeah. on this show, but I can't take it away from them, man. It's, it's, well, there's, uh, it's, there's a difference it's between, album. yeah, there's a difference between your tasting music and what you believe it's, it is good and yeah. remarkable or, or important. Yeah. You know, I agree. Excellent. And that's, and that's what it is. Uh, um, I, go on. One, yeah. One thing I want to say about the album cover, you know, the building, at the end oh, of go on. Picture. Yeah, go on. <laughs> now, hold on. If, for those watching, wait, can you see my mouse on the screen or not? Uh, no, I can't no, see. Right. So I'm going to use my it. finger. Uh, it's that, this one, isn't it, right? This building, yeah. So for, for viewers All on the YouTube, way watch <laughs> that building and that window. Go on, Felipe, tell him. I lived in that room. <laughs> on the top for two years <laughs> that one <laughs> yeah yes you did and i visited you several times it's probably I? the most rock and roll thing about my life is that i lived in a, in a rock album's cover not not that I... you're one of the most sought after blues drummers in soho or that you're gigging literally seven nights a week no, it's, no, the, it's I, that you lived I in lived, that yeah i lived in an album cover that's super cool uh, a couple you of things about day, this Do you, uh, one day i'm going to superimpose your face on that and i'll give you a vinyl no. i'll be like hey felipe there you go and you won't notice until you look one day and you're like oh well, that's stuck a picture of my face in it. <laughs> yeah. No, check check this out. There's an interesting thing about this. So that's Berwick Street in Soho. And um, it, you you might wonder why people from Manchester would do an album cover in, in London. Uh, basically, I think they used to go there and shop, uh, you know, CDs, buy CD, or, not sorry, CDs, vinyls, like yeah. rec proper records. So uh, the, the road is famous for uh, the, the, the record shops. And, and, uh, and I think that was... That was the reason why they decided to do the album there. You have a man in the background, apart from the two guys in the front who are not the Gallagher brothers, by the way, that uh, on, yeah. Yeah, on that side, that man, he's covering his face with something. Can you see that? So that man yeah. is the producer of the album. Ah. And that thing is the master tape of the album. No way. <laughs> yeah. The object he's using to cover his face is the Brilliant. master tape of the album. Nice touch, isn't it? Uh, is this Noel and Liam? <laughs> no. No, that's just, a, just that's a, that's a DJ and a designer. They have nothing Excellent. to do with uh, with the band, I guess, or or I think nice. they are maybe the designer worked in the album. I don't know, but they not them. them. Yeah. Well, thank you for thanks <laughs> for pointing people. That out. Yeah, that's cool stuff. So <laughs> yeah. their headline: Felipe lived in the album cover of What's the Story? Morning Glory. That's there you go. it. That's my claim um, to fame. Let's um, move on to the. Do you have anything else to say about the music? No, no. No. <laughs> so let's move on to the themes and the lyrics of the album. And I know you always touch on lyrics. Before you do, though, before you talk yeah. about some certain lyrics of the album, I want to shape what I was talking about, about Britain in the 90s. This yeah. is an era we called Cool Britannia mm -hmm. because Britain was in a great place. Now, let's just explain some points. So this is post-Thatcher. Thatcher was in power for, was it 12 or 13 years? Um, and it ended in the early 90s. Britain had a desire for something new. It had become very stale under Thatcher through the 80s that when New Labour and Tony Blair came into power, for good or for bad, whatever side of the fence you sit on, it was new and it brought a, a hope to Britain that actually so our country can be a bit different. There was a renewed sense of national pride, cultural confidence, and essentially economic optimism around, the, around Britain. People were happy. And Britain became proud of itself and what it had to offer the world. And in the arts department, it flourished everywhere. In music, you had the Britpop that was a nostalgic nod back to the 60s. It wasn't like, oh, let's try this new electronic stuff of the 80s. Let's, let's do what we're good at and take it back to what it was like in the 60s. In fashion, you had the likes of Alexander McQueen, Stella McCartney, Vivian Westwood doing their thing. In art, you had Damien Hirst and Tracy Emin. In movies, you had Danny Boyle and Guy Ritchie, you know, movies like Lock, Stock, Two Smoking Barrels that were quintessentially so British. Um, and just as well as that, a general sense of celebrating Britishness through celebrity culture, magazines and media. Britain was apparently a good place to be. I was born halfway through it. I was born in the 1995, so I couldn't experience it. But there was a pride about it. And this is why we had the rise of Britpop and bands. And we mentioned it in the Stereophonics episode as well. Bands singing about British life. They were happy. I mean, I know not all the areas were economically yeah. prosperous. And there were, there were, it's not like everything was perfect. But culturally, but it was a still, happy moment. Though. Culturally, it was a happy moment for all the negatives you still wanted to sing about how proud you were about being british yeah and, and so it's an interesting mind, thing please, I, I, please talk to us about the lyrics you know so yeah one, one thing i noticed like in regards to that is like uh first time i went to america i, I, I saw flags everywhere and it's like you know 
you know, the, the 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 USA flag everywhere, and in 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 Britain you don't see people waving the flag that much. You don't see too uh, too many flags. It's not it's not a typical thing uh, in this country. And apparently in the Britpop era, um, it was kind of a thing to have the Union Jack everywhere, right? And in guitars and and you know. Um, in shops and everything, so that's that's an interesting thing from, from that time. Yeah. So lyrics, uh, I actually I actually have a, a couple of uh, uh, lines that I really like from from uh, Don't Look Back in Anger, yeah, that's good. which is, which I think it's if you young at that time listening to rock music, that's what you want to hear. I love this. Gonna start a, uh, I'm gonna start a revolution from my bed. It's just like <laughs> yes, yes, such a teenage great. thing to say. And don't put your life in the hands of a rock and roll band, which they were doing. <laughs> I think it's it's yeah, it, it it's an amazing uh, choice of words. It's really really clever. It just and, had this way of mixing emotions and romance and actual emotional feels, like we said they were doing in America with grunge, yeah. but making it a bit funnier. A bit simplistic, yeah. a bit tongue in cheek. Yeah, there's there's a, there's a, a quote from uh, Noel uh, in 1995 speaking to NME uh, magazine uh, about that's about Champagne Supernova, which I, I love. I love the song. I think it's a great. That's an interesting point. Is a, a, a really strong song to close an album. You, you know, sometimes you're going to have a filler at the end of the album, and it's yeah. that's one of the things that re. That's one thing that really upsets me. If I listen to a whole album and it's great, and the last couple of songs are kind of average, yeah, yeah. I, it makes me feel bad. Champagne Supernova as one of their best songs ever. Being at the the end of the album, it's it's a great choice. I don't know if it was the last one to be recorded or whatever. Mm. But it was a it was an amazing amazing choice to put it in the end of the album. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so basically, uh, uh, Noel Gallagher talking about that song. He said it means different things when I'm in different moods. So when I'm in a bad mood, being caught beneath a landslide is like being suffocated. So, I, I, and I think uh, the other thing he said is like, uh, it's about when you're young and you see people in groups and you think about what they did for you and they did nothing. So it's about like, you you think you belong to a group, but maybe you don't, maybe they don't care about you. Yeah. Um, so it's an individual reflection on, on, on life, I guess. And, I, and as I said, it might mean different things for himself. So imagine if you're listening to that song, any song from this album, it, it might mean whatever you want it to mean. Yeah. If if the songwriter himself says, well, it, it can mean different things in different days. So that's that's one of the, uh, the, the, the greatest uh, things about the album is... The lyrics are uh, clever, but not overcomplicated, and kind of open to inter interpretation. So, yeah, and they're very. They're, I think I said it already. They're tongue in cheek. They're very. Yeah. I don't want to say they're funny because they're not all funny, but they're, some they're, of them. They I make think. you smile. I think. Yeah. I think you can read them, and they make you smile. Yeah. Awesome. So let's finish up with the accolades and the legacy of this album. So, twenty-two million claimed sales. That's a lot. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a lot. It would. It's gone on to become the fifth highest selling album in the UK. So that's not yeah. the fifth highest selling album by a UK band in the yeah. UK. In the UK. So it's even massive. compared to American artists, everyone else. That's, yeah. That's um, the album. The, the the legacy of the album is so important and significant because we, we it hasn't. It didn't really innovate or pioneer anything that wasn't going on in the years before. I suppose maybe you could argue it polished up the sound. The orchestras were kind of a bit different to how raw and energetic the rest of Britpop was. But this uh, this album became synonymous with the Britpop movement and the cool Britannia. It just signified a moment in time where Britons were proud to be British. They were happy with, gen in general, how life was going. There was a sense of renewed optimism and cultural pride about it. And this album stood as that landmark. You've got timeless hit singles like Wonderwall, Don't Look Back in Anger, Champagne Supernova, as well as ones everyone knows, like Roll With It, She's Electric, you know, um, what's the other one some might say? I think these songs resonated with the British fans because it did define their lifestyle in the 90s and people just connect with that, don't they? Yeah. Exactly, and it's it's and it's uh, it it defines an era in music, and um, and it does it well, you know. Uh, yeah. I think, and also, I would say the the quality of um, the songwriting is still the most uh, relevant thing about the album, because as I said, there's not that much innovation in terms of production. It's interesting, but it's not 
like wow the, the pop music was changed forever because of this production i would say so it's, it's still more about the quality of the songs and uh, and the way the band sounded than anything else that's my opinion yeah anyway. i agree there's, uh, a, there's a sorry before you go on yeah. i just wanted to say there's a chord in don't look back in anger which when i used to play at functions i think it was very simple to just play i, th I don't know i think it was like an f in the as a root note but I remember looking at the chord and it was something crazy. It was like a jazzy chord. It's, it's, so I start a revolution from my bed. It's the first chord. It's something like, I'm not even going to try and remember it, but it's weird. It's like an F sharp five with a C in the bass or something. Yeah. And I remember looking at that and when, when I first started, you know, you remember me, we were, we were playing our jazz band, weren't we? And we were yeah. loving all these chords. And I just, I just played this arpeggio over that chord that should not have worked because it was dissonant. It wasn't nice. It was a jazz chord I was playing. I should have just been playing a root note, but I played the yeah. whole chord, but it just worked. And I yeah. thought, that is special. That I'm here playing as an A minor followed by a G major. It's all very predictable. And suddenly, this augmented jazz chord pops up and presents a real sense of tension. And you hear it, it goes, because the tension is in the first part. So I start a revolution. That's the tension. And yeah. then it resolves from my bed. And it's just so simplistic, but so key to have picked that chord and made it work. I've, I've, I've said before, I love that song. I love that song. It's it's stunning. Yeah, it is a great song. Um, yeah. But yeah, sorry, you you were you in the middle of saying something. No, no, I'm saying I'm just saying that um, uh, the the chord progressions they they they're kind of simple, but there's always a bit of a surprise. You know? Yeah, and that's what Every I said earlier about that. Then they throw one yeah, chord yeah, like, yeah. well, it's simple, but it's not that predictable. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah which is, no, which is great. Yeah. And the final point to make is just that, you know, this this album and ultimately this band would go on to influence the likes of Arctic Monkeys, Coldplay, um, yeah. you know, the Killers, who were an American band, really? came out really? and said, this is one of our biggest influences. Wow. Great. There you go. See? And, and, and um, well, I have a question for you. Okay. Um, are you buying a ticket for the reunion? Tour? I was just going to move on to that part. I said, let's talk about the reunion. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I haven't seen the prices yet. But I considered it to go and hear Don't Look Back. And I, I can't stress enough how much I love that song, which is crazy considering I'm telling you all how much I hate the album. I have a friend I have a friend who hates Oasis. He loves Wonderwall. He says <laughs> there you go. It's the same it's thing. Like, yeah. I know how annoying the song is, but it's such a masterpiece of yeah. pop music. My and issue... like, those guys, they should have existed just to write that song. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> my issue with those kind of gigs is the crowd is going to be huge. But I said to my wife, I was like, well, you know, I, I can't stand Wonderwall. So when they finish with that, we'll get out early. Um, <laughs> but um, no, I'm not going to go. I, I think ultimately the price will be too much. I don't want I, I, yeah, to. Uh, do you know what? It's, it's It wouldn't be fair. Someone else could have that ticket. Yeah, and really appreciate a proper this band. fan. A proper yeah. fan. And I'm going to go. Oh, I, I could go like Oasis. I'm not going to the show. I'm just saying though, a, a real fan should be able to take this, not just me, because I can afford it, and I want to go see one song. That's a bit disingenuous. So, no, I'm not going to go. What about yourself? Do you fancy it? No. Nah, well, if 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 well, I, I will wait. You're for you're, the you're the master, announcement. but you're the master of getting random tickets to crazy events because you went to see Eric Clapton a few months ago out of yeah, nowhere. Exactly. I was you knew a guy who knew Clapton. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. but you also you went to see Scorpions as well because you got yeah, that well, ticket. Yeah, well, that wasn't that wasn't so random. I wanted to go. To All that right, gig, okay. So, yeah. But who knows, man? You might. <laughs> but get maybe a someone is going to get me a ticket yeah. to the Oasis gig. No, you no, guys no. listening well, to the show now, get me a ticket. I'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> what would you think about the reunion anyway? I mean, in general, I think I think well. Maybe someone needs, or maybe one of them got into a, a, a mortgage for a mansion, or they want to buy new cars, <laughs> which are great reasons to to get a band together. Also, I think they wanted that break, uh, despite all the, um, the, it, the 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 fights might be real, might not. I don't care. The thing is, it's good to do your own thing, like solo careers and stuff, and eventually recognize that you have a legacy, and they've created some amazing stuff together, and it's. They're it's totally fine that they, they back doing it. And I don't think anyone is complaining unless you really hate the music, which in any case, you can't get away from it. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, are, they are two big personalities, aren't they? And yeah. I think when, you know, uh, I haven't followed anything about their arguments, but I can imagine it led to multiple clashes and yeah. they probably needed the break, you know? And yeah, if, if, if they was... think now's the right time to come back, then cool. One thing that, uh, that we can definitely say is if it wasn't for this particular album, they wouldn't be big enough to do a reunion decades later and still be 
I think it's if been not trending. as relevant as back in the day, even more relevant yeah. now. I think it's been trending on Twitter for three days now in number yeah. one spot. Oh, no, it's you insane. Say, there's a market yeah. for it. There's a market for it. Yeah. Yeah, but anyway, cool. I mean, I'm really happy for the Oasis fans, honestly. Like, if I'm trying to think of one of my favorite bands that don't exist anymore and that I wish they'd come together, you know, do you know what I mean? If they yeah. could, not like I know. Well, when Led Zeppelin came together again in 2007, I was really happy. I couldn't get a ticket to it, but oh, anyway. I think that was like gold <laughs> dust, wasn't it? But anyway, yeah. so yeah, um, thank you for joining us. Is that, is that it? Anything else you want to say? Oh, I have a monologue. Oh, God, I forgot. Yeah. yeah. So See? Felipe's taking my monologue is... because, like I said, I thought it wouldn't be right for me to do it. Mm. So please go on, sir. Give us your yeah. monologue. I mean, I, I obviously lack the uh, academic English skills that you have. So my monologue's not going to be that great. I'm, I, I, oh, don't you know, I, I short, don't man. apologize for that. <clears throat> don't say Let's yourself short. You talk really well. <laughs> go for it. So here, here we go. Uh, what's the story in Morning Glory proved that Oasis could write even more impactful hit songs than the ones from their extremely successful debut album. As a consequence, they have created a legacy that outlived the Britpop era and kept attracting followers and haters from all over the world. Sing-along choruses, simple but clever chord progressions, distorted guitars, and an instantly recognizable vocal style are some of the reasons that made this album a huge success. Most critics would claim that Oasis has never produced anything as good as What's the Story, Morning Glory. And I agree with them. In my humble opinion, this is a singular moment in the band's history where the quality of their music has spoken much louder than their rock and roll attitude or controversial inter interviews. From the release of the album to this day, it's virtually impossible to go to a party, wedding or pub gig in the UK without listening to one of the Oasis hit songs. Uh, they have definitely written their names into pop music history with Champagne Supernova, Wonderwall, and Don't Look Back in Anger. This is Oasis in all their glory, pun intended. They might be too <laughs> pop for a rock band, or maybe their attitude is too rock for the pop music industry, but they probably don't give a flying fuck about that anyway. <laughs> Brilliant. Is that that's, it? Brilliant, man. That was really good. Do you know the part I agreed with most and the part I enjoyed is that... When I was growing up and I hadn't heard, and I didn't know that this was an Oasis album or I didn't know what songs were on it, all I heard was about the brothers because they were always in the media fighting or just one had released a new album or whatever. You're right when you said this album superseded any argument or public thing they ever had. And there's a famous gig, isn't it, Oasis at Nebworth? Yeah. Anything that came out, anything that you ignore that isn't an album, public feuds, special gigs, reunions, this and that, you are right when you said this album trumps them all. Yeah. And that's why it's so iconic because you might have an album that wasn't as good. And actually after they released the album, the brothers had a public spat and one of them hit the other one. And that becomes the big news with yeah. this. Nothing was ever going to top it because the songs are so well written. They're so well crafted and they're performed with the same energy, rawness and, and punkiness that, that the fans loved from the first album, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I think like in, in, in rock and pop music, you have um, personalities, big personalities, uh, uh, that are, you know, big characters that um, become celebrities. That's what it is. They, if you have in a famous band, you're a celebrity. And sometimes people care too much about that. It's all, it's, it's, it's all about what's in the news, what the, the, this guy said about the other guy. The music was and, the focus here, And isn't it? I really love when people put together an album that the music can really speak louder than anything else. And they did that really well with this album. Yeah, fantastic, cool. All right. All right, guys, well, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Long Live Rock and Roll podcast. Let us know your thoughts on the album uh, in the comments. And if you're gonna grab a ticket to see them next year, very exciting times. I think they go on sale uh, well, on Saturday, so two days from now. Um, Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please give us a like and a subscribe so you can stay up to date with our content, our shorts, our new episodes. And if you're listening on Amazon, Spotify, or Apple, do us a favor, scroll down, give us a little rating, write us a little review. It takes about 30 seconds of your time, but does the world of good for us because we'll be thrown up the charts, we'll be shown to more rock and roll fans like yourself, and we'll this, hopefully we'll make this show grow. So thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for being with us again. And uh, thanks for anyone who, who has listened to any of the episodes or downloaded the episodes. It's really, really good to have you guys on board. Thanks a lot. Well, so keep on rocking, everyone, and don't do anything I wouldn't do. As usual, guys, take care and long live rock and roll. <laughs>